Well, wasn't that a great morning? Are you blessed? I trust you are. I'm blessed. Um, our Anita, wow, that was so beautiful. <laughs> that really encouraged me as well. So bless you. Uh, uh, thank you for doing that. Um, a real encouragement to, to so many of us this morning. Um, and uh, this isn't the first time, I have to say, that, that people uh, started in Kilmarnock in Scotland when uh, people were coming to me um, where God had given them poems and uh, people who'd never written poetry before. Uh, so this is, quite, this is not new, uh, obviously not new, but it, it was wonderful. So Anita, God bless you, that was lovely this morning. And great to hear what's going on with, with uh, the programme for frozen meals from Peter. Uh, this is, these are exciting days, aren't they? Um, there's so much happening and uh, so much to get involved in. God, God is doing a, a wonderful thing and we need to be prepared to, to give the reason for the hope that we have uh, because folks are wanting to know. Okay, before I bring God's word then, just to say the announcements for this coming week. Um, first of all, tonight, six o'clock, uh, Ivan and friends will be going live on Facebook um, and I believe Zoom as well, but certainly live on Facebook and you'll be able to join with them in worship uh, together in the flat there in, in Colwyn Bay. And uh, then on Wednesday, um, a little development on for my daily broadcast every morning. Uh, Wednesday evening, we're starting our new Bible study on Zoom. Uh, no, we're not doing a Bible study on Zoom. On Zoom, we're doing a Bible study and that uh, is gonna be on the life of David, King David. Um, we've spent most mornings over the last couple of weeks looking at the Psalms and what I call the watering holes that we turn to in the Psalms when we, when we need to be uh, refreshed uh, by God's word. And so um, I felt it, we've seen most of David's Psalms, where it'd be good to do a little study on his life. So on Wednesday at seven o'clock, uh, we will be holding a Bible study, which you'll be able to join into uh, on Zoom. So watch out for the daily broadcasts and we will give you the ID number for uh, joining in with the session. Okay, so that's on Wednesday. I think that's all the announcements for the coming week, uh, at the moment anyway. So be blessed in all that. And join with me in the mornings for the daily broadcast. Um, I've usually been able to get them up onto uh, YouTube by about midday and uh, available then for you to, to be encouraged by and to share, share them out to friends and family and see what God is, is, is doing. God bless you. Right, so we come to God's Word. Um, I, I'm at a little bit of two minds as to whether to call today's sermon Surviving the Storm or The Two Builders. <laughs> Well, I think I'd like the sound of surviving the storm, personally. Um, so here we go. We all know the mantra by now, don't we? We can say it without even looking at the podium. Stay at home, protect the NHS, save lives. <laughs> you know it off by heart. It's easy to remember because nobody who comes to the podium in Downing Street, number 10, at five o'clock for the daily briefing make sure that they stay on script and repeat the mantra constant, constantly. They all do it. Repeating it not only when they make their opening remarks, repeating it when answering the questions from the press and repeating it once again before disappearing uh, through the, the uh, oak panelled doorway behind them. And that goes for the chief medical officer, the chief scientific advisor, the army chief, or anybody else who joins with them in their daily speech. It's important. We can all say it without thinking because wherever we look, wherever we happen to be listening to, whatever channel we hop to, the message is the same, stay at home, protect the NHS, save lives. Excellent. We've got it. You've got it. We at least know what we've been told to do. I think the majority of the population in the UK understand what stay at home means. 
and the nation has primarily got the message that our obedience will then protect the NHS and therefore means we'll save lives. Thimples. Of course it's thimples. And the government is quite shocked that the vast majority of the UK have obeyed and have stayed at home for the last month. The NHS has coped so far and inevitably many lives have been saved. So that really is good news. The government is delighted that we've turned out to be good citizens and have complied. Well, at least the majority have. And so, we have been told that the peak of infection seems to have been reached in the UK and the daily graphs are showing us that we are starting to come down the other side of the hill. But don't forget, it will take longer to come down than it, goes, it takes to go up. And the tragedy, or sorry, the strategy of number 10 is simple. We weather the storm and come out the other side of this pandemic with an NHS that's intact. The total number of deaths in the country is not catastrophic and the economy doesn't completely collapse. You see, it's good to have a plan. And it's crucial that the plan is a good one and that the plan is put into action. And the only word to use for that is obedience. Mm, let's not use that word too much, huh? The result, we survived the storm. Now, we're constantly being told that this current crisis is by no means over. Remember, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And so the cliches go on and on. For the government to come up with such a plan, they needed help. And they are the first to admit, or indeed, hide behind the fact that they have taken every step in the whole process by listening to the experts and the science. Again, we know the mantra off by heart. Whether they made mistakes or not, the issue is not up for debate at the moment because they have the answer ready for you. We only did what the science and the experts were telling us to do. Now, I'm sure most of you will agree with me that Jesus Christ is undoubtedly an expert in every field. Indeed, today we're going to see that he is a double expert. <laughs> Normally, if you're like me, when you hear that someone is an expert in their field of study, then you tend to take a deep breath. <gasps> Come on, do it with me. <gasps> okay. And you either switch off or turn over, and I'm not talking about the TV, or you pretend to be listening by nodding at all the appropriate moments or maybe shaking your head or even taking a tut and finally you try to hide your yawns the definition of an expert you may have heard this before but it's worth repeating again x is the unknown quantity isn't it and spurt is a drip under pressure well, whether you like that definition or not, I don't know. But not a lot has changed over the years since I first heard that brilliant description. However, we are about to learn something quite incredible, important, from the expert of all experts, who sadly is quite unknown to many, but most certainly was never a drip and was never under pressure. His name, of course, Jesus Christ. One of the most powerful things about Jesus' ministry was his remarkable storytelling. He painted fabulous pictures, painted on the canvas of real life, that were brought to life by believable characters who you could have met any day in the street of Jerusalem at that time. One of the most well-known stories, or painted pictures, is the story of the two builders. Let's read it together, shall we? From Matthew chapter 7, reading from verse 24 to the end of the chapter. The wise and foolish builders. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine puts them into practice. It's like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice 
is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. And when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority, and not as their teachers of the law. Quite a well-known scripture there. I mentioned that Jesus is an expert in a double sense. First of all, he knows the scriptures. We know that Jesus is known as the, the Word. John chapter 1 verse 14, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now that is a fabulous bio. I think you'd agree. If Jesus was being invited to speak at an auspicious occasion with an audience of notable and distinguished guests who were experts in their fields, then John 1 verse 14 would be a great way to introduce our next speaker, don't you think? The Word who became flesh and dwelt among us. John had come to learn who Jesus was, God in the flesh, the God-man, Jesus Christ. John 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was the God, he was with God in the beginning. No doubt about it, Jesus qualifies. He is the Word that became flesh, and he knew the Scriptures. Indeed, he is the fulfillment of the Scriptures. And before we note the details of the very graphic picture of the two builders, it's interesting to notice that Jesus was putting a not so well known proverb into a storyboard picture that everybody would then be able to understand. The proverb that you may or may not know is Proverbs chapter 10, verse 25. It says, when the storm has swept by, the wicked are gone, but the righteous stand firm forever. Hmm, there we go. Proverbs 10, verse 25. If ever anyone could pull out of the Old Testament an obscure or hidden proverb and make it come alive, Jesus could. Secondly, Jesus was an expert in life. Remember, he is the God-man. The Word who was with God is God and who was made flesh and lived among us. If there was anyone who knows about life, then it must surely be the author of life. Listen for a moment as Paul tries to describe who Jesus is to the Christians in Colossae. So Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 17. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Wow! I think you'll agree with me that Jesus is most certainly a double-bagged expert, not just bringing to life the Old Testament scriptures, but in bringing life into deadly storms. You see, don't forget, Jesus was a carpenter, and so he had first-hand knowledge about building houses. And as a master craftsman, he knew that if you are going to build a house, then location is nearly everything. We might say we've been taught the mantra, location, location, location. Yes, true. But Jesus had a more important matter to bring to the table. It's not just where you are going to build this house, but what are you going to build it on? Indeed, the mantra on this occasion is foundation, foundation, foundation. Whether you are familiar with this powerful story or not, I am pretty sure that your response to me today, on first hearing it, would be, 
Well, that's a bit obvious, isn't it? Every, uh, everybody knows not to build a house on sand, don't they? Well, yes, in the 21st century, we have probably all learned that this is true, especially here in the UK or in the developed West, a development, uh, a developed society that we live in with all the building regulations galore, the statutory bodies checking every little detail before, during and after construction. But remember, Jesus was painting this vivid picture in Israel in the first century, in a barren landscape that had some big surprises hidden in its geography. You see, this story is not far-fetched at all. Jesus is painting a picture that his listeners would instantly recognize as something that happened quite regularly. Maybe it was in the newspaper last week. <laughs> quite possible. Hey, man! That's right! I read it! I read it in the Judean journal. It was old Zacchaeus. Yeah, I, it was him. I saw it. Why was that? You see, in that time, it was crucial for our friend Zacchaeus and all his building buddies to plan ahead. They needed to be forward thinking. Not to include all the latest gadgets and gizmos. No, they needed to be forward thinking as to the season. You see, in the countryside in Israel at that time, there were many gullies, which during the summer were very pleasant sandy hollows. However, in the winter, wow, you had to be kidding. In the winter, the same pleasant, beautiful gully became a raging torrent of rushing water. The mistake that our imaginary friend Zacharias made was to build his house in a dried up riverbed. And when the winter came, his house disintegrated, washed away in the torrent of water. Now, I said last week that Whatever we buy cheap never lasts. And that's the truth about Zacchaeus. And he watched his house being swept away. You see, it would have been easy to dig in the sand, wouldn't it? There would no, no real effort required compared to digging into the rock. No resistance, no hidden challenges. Straightforward, quick and easy. Hey, see, it was cheap to build this one. No problems at all, man. Went up quick as you could see it. No, no doubt you will have worked out that I'm not wanting to talk about house building today. And neither was Jesus. You might be interested to notice that this story or this picture board was the last recorded part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. You see, we're all familiar possibly with the Beatitudes and some of the other things that Jesus taught that day to the crowds on the mountaintop. But the story of the wise and foolish builders was the parting shot. You see, it's all about obedience. Oh, that's that word again. The word that the government of today is very reluctant to use too much. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, Jesus says, and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So Jesus is using this story in closing the day's teaching to let the hearers know it's now their turn. It's now your turn. They had heard wonderful teaching that day. The Beatitudes what their attitude should be when they faced different situations and if they wanted to live a life that's truly blessed. That they were to be shakers and shiners, salt and light. He spoke about murder, marriage, divorce, loving your enemies. I hope the sequence isn't appropriate for one another there. 
giving to the needy, how to pray, the Lord's Prayer, fasting, treasure in heaven. Jesus also dealt with no worries, judging others, ask, seek and knock, and a tree that bears good or bad fruit. You see, the final story has nothing to do with house building, but has everything to do with life building. And then you get it, and so do I. Jesus is actually warning all of us about the storms in life that will come so unexpectedly. They will come. Indeed, the biggest financial and economic storm has just hit this world for centuries. And such a storm, such a huge torrent of water is now starting to hit everybody's house. So Jesus is telling you today that if you are wise, you will build your life on him. If you are foolish, then you will build your life on superficial things. Jesus, remember, has just gone through a list of life issues that need to be built on. We would say a firm foundation. Knowing real happiness and blessing, no matter what life looks like around you. The Beatitudes, I read them at the start of this morning's service. How about bringing savour and flavour to life for all those who you know in a world that's become bland and dark, salt and light? What is love? And how can I love my enemy? How should I pray? Why worrying is a waste of time and energy. Why should I avoid trying to take a splinter out of someone else's eye when I have a plank of wood in my own eye? It's called judging others. Remember that what is in your heart will show up. It will show up in the fruit that you bear on your tree. Good fruit or bad fruit. And then at the end of this fabulous day of teaching, Jesus says, you need to build on the rock. Building your life and how your life and how you live your life every day is crucially important. And now we all know how important because the storm has just hit. Verse 25, the rain came down, the streams arose and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. Throughout the Bible, we are told that God is the rock, the firm foundation, the one who will be our strength, who will be our security, who will be our defense, who will be our stronghold, Build your life on Jesus today. He's the rock that doesn't roll. However, building your life on a good education, having a good job that pays well, living in an exclusive house with good neighbours and drive the latest land cruiser, having all the trimmings, gadgets and gizmos, friends and parties and the like. What does it all amount to? It's called building your life on temporary things that have no substance, no security, here today and gone tomorrow. And yes, of course, don't get me wrong, it's good to have a good education. Yes, of course, it's good to have a a well-paid job and there's nothing wrong with living in a nice house etc etc but if that's the be all and end all of your life then it's called sand sadly today most people build their lives on the temporary things of life they look after number one and make sure that they ca they cater for all their own needs first fulfill all their own desires and dreams first and Jesus describes such life builders as foolish. 
Verse 27, the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. If that's been you, then be prepared today. The storm has just arrived, and it's only the beginning. And the torrent of water is bearing down on you. Jesus, first of all, asked you to listen up. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine, if you've got ears, use them right now. You need to hear what Jesus has said. Sadly, most people in the UK don't even know who Jesus is. They have no idea whatever. Indeed, what little bit they think they know has actually nothing to do with what Jesus actually said or taught. But Jesus didn't just leave it at hearing these words of mine. He then made a crucial point and says, and puts them into practice. That's important, not just hearing the words, but putting them into practice. And there's the rub today. It's not just hearing, it's doing. If up to now you have been building your life on the thrills of temporary benefits today and just have ignored the eternal blessings of tomorrow, then make the change today. Jesus Christ is the rock. He alone is the firm foundation on which to build your life. Yes, I encourage you, please do this. Read your Bible. I encourage you to read through the Gospels. Find out for yourself what Jesus said and taught. Don't listen to other people's opinions. You want to know for yourself. You want to know what Jesus says to you. And you will be amazed. You'll be astonished. The end of this sermon, the end of Jesus' teaching that day, verses 28 and 29, when Jesus had finished saying these things, not just about the wise men or the, and the foolish building their house, but the whole day's teaching, Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed. They were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority, and not as the teachers of the law. Jesus brought teaching which re was relevant to daily life and living, building on the rock. I promise you that in taking the time out to find out for yourself, you will not be the same. The Sermon on the Mount as we know it starts in Matthew chapter 5, finishes at the end of chapter 7. Find yourself a Bible. Make contact with me if you need to, if you haven't got one, and I'll get a Bible to you, free of charge. I want you to read it and then I want you to put it into practice. Not just be hearers of the word, but doers. Put it into practice. Build your life on the rock. His name is Jesus. And when the storm hits, your life will not fall flat because you're fastened to the rock. And you will survive the storm. Be blessed today. Please make contact with me if you, if you have been challenged by what you've heard today. I want to know that you're building your house on that firm foundation, Jesus Christ himself. He's the rock that doesn't roll. He's the rock that gives you that stability and that security that you can face tomorrow. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he holds my future and my life is worth the living just because he lives. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you 
that Jesus came to pay the price for my sin that he died on the cross to take the punishment that was due on me he took it all so that I might be forgiven that I might be set free thank you that I can build my life on Jesus the eternal rock the sure foundation we pray today for anyone who doesn't know you in such a way that they build their lives from today on you that they turn to you and from this day forward live for you Lord we ask that many will come to know you through this storm the storm that has brought many questions to mind for many people who don't know which way to turn Lord I pray today that those who hear this message will turn to you and build their lives on the solid rock in Jesus name we pray these things Amen have a good week be blessed and we'll see you again next Sunday God bless you